Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. Um, a very warm welcome to this special evening uh, on the How To Academy. Uh, my name is Matthew Dancona. I'm editor-in-chief of Drugstore Culture, a new culture and politics magazine. Do visit us at www.drugstoreculture.com. Um, if, like me, you are obsessed by politics, political change, political ideas, when something new comes along, uh, you want to know what the man we're going to hear tonight has to say about it. And identity politics, for me, is such a core subject. It's so important to what's going on in so many ways around the world that as it became more important, I was really hoping that uh, Francis Fukuyama would write a book about it, and he has, which he's going to talk about tonight. The format of the evening is he will speak for about 15 minutes, he and I will have a chat, and then there'll be an opportunity for you all to ask him questions. Um, he's a man who really needs little introduction. He's a professor at Stanford University. He's been world famous since his uh, extraordinarily successful book, The End of History, and uh, numerous books since have come out, Trust, uh, Political Order and Political Decay, The Origins of Political Order, and many others. Um, he is a force in political ideas, and uh, there is no one else like him. Please join me in welcoming Francis Fukuyama. Thank you. So, um, Matthew, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It's a delight to be here in London. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, we in California aren't used to this kind of weather, so I, you know, for me it would, would have been a big sacrifice, so I appreciate that. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk about this question of identity, which I think actually goes deeper than what we refer to as identity politics in the uh, current debate. The reason that I chose this topic, I was actually diverted from my normal research agenda, really by the elections of 2016 that brought Britain out of the EU and Donald Trump uh, into the White House. Uh, I think that this constitutes a, a threat to liberal democracy, not to democracy as such. Uh, these were the results of legitimate elections, but the result of putting someone like Donald Trump in office, I think, is to threaten, in a way, the institutional order of a properly working liberal democracy. I think this is part of a larger trend in world politics that involves uh, people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, the Law and Justice Party in Poland, President Erdogan in Turkey. In all of these cases, you have democratically elected leaders that are using their democratic legitimacy to attack the checks and balances that are important parts of a properly functioning constitutional order. Uh, because they believe that they have a kind of charismatic authority that is inherited from their direct relationship uh, to the people. And I think in my uh, particular, uh, in my own country, uh, I think this is embodied in Trump's attack on the FBI, on the Justice Department, on the Mueller investigation, uh, as well as on the mainstream media, which he's called uh, the enemy of the American people. And so this is a kind of demagogic language that again, does not threaten democracy as such, it threatens the liberal part of liberal democracy, the rule of law and the constitutional uh, order. And I think this is going on already in Europe, uh, in Hungary and Poland. There are parties like this nipping at the heels uh, of the mainstream parties in Germany, in France, in many other places. So that's kind of the crisis of democracy. I wanted to understand what was Leading to this, I think the conventional wisdom had to do with economics, globalization. As we are now, I think, quite aware, globalization left a lot of losers, people that had suffered uh, job loss from deindustrialization, the moving of, um, of manufacturing to Asia and to other parts of the developing world. But I think that this, to me, misses an important uh, dimension of what's been going on. If it had been the case that, that uh, the increasingly unequal global order that has left a narrow band of oligarchs in every country and then the 99% uh, that are doing much less well, if that had been the only issue going on, then left-wing parties uh, 
should have been the inheritors of the populist energy that flowed out of the financial crisis in 2008 or the euro crisis in 2010. Instead, it's been right-wing anti-immigrant populist parties that have gained power. They're, they're the ones that have gotten the energy. And I think it's really because of this issue of identity. It's really not uh, simply economic displacement. It is also cultural displacement that's driving people. Now, I have a very specific definition of identity. You know, identity is what's on your driver's license. Uh, that's one version of it. But I think that identity in the political sense has several different sources. One of them is a universal psychological characteristic, which the Greeks called thumos, which means spiritedness. It's the part of the human psyche that demands respect and dignity, a uh, recognition of one's dignity. And it's kind of an inherently political uh, tendency because it's not just enough to feel self-esteem. You don't feel self-esteem unless other people uh, properly esteem you. And in the modern world, it takes the form of a belief that I have an inner self that sometimes may be deeply buried and it is not being respected, it is being ignored or actively disrespected. I think that this is actually uh, one of the drivers of modern politics. It's actually at the source of many of the political movements uh, that we see around us, including liberal democracy itself. So, in Tunisia, Mohamed Bouazizi in 2011 set himself on fire because he had his livelihood confiscated by the Tunisian dictatorship. He could not get an answer as to where his vegetable cart had gone, and therefore he doused himself with gasoline, uh, set himself on fire, and his self-immolation sparked uh, uh, the Arab Spring. In every Arab country, people understood his, his agony that they were living under dictatorships that did not take him seriously as a human being. Uh, and this is what led to the downfall of Mubarak, of the Ben Ali regime, of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, and the like. Now, it went bad in the long run, but this is the basis, I think, of all movements against uh, dictatorship. They do not recognize their citizens as human beings. On the other hand, a democracy, a properly functioning democracy, does that by giving people rights to speech, uh, to association, to belief, and ultimately to political participation. And you can weave a, a, a similar story in Ukraine and Georgia and other places that have experienced democratic revolutions. In other forms, it can take the form of nationalism, a kind of the evil twin of liberal democracy where the group that needs recognition is a cultural group, usually bound by language or common history that wants to have its own political community. That's really what lay at the origins of the world wars in uh, uh, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and this is a case where the demand for equal respect moves over into the demand for superior respect very easily. And this is one of the problems with this kind of dignity uh, this kind of dignity politics. Now, to get us to the present, I think you have to look a little bit at the, uh, the genealogy of what we actually call identity politics in the present. I believe that it really starts on the left rather than the right. Uh, it starts in the 1960s with the emergence of different social movements on behalf of uh, racial minorities, women, uh, gays and lesbians, uh, the disabled, you know, there are many groups in mainstream European, North American societies that were not respected. They were ignored at best and actively discriminated against uh, by the mainstream society, which was largely white and male. Uh, and as a result, they were pushing back and they were seeking social justice. So this was a perfectly legitimate uh, part of being included in a liberal uh, order. Uh, but it had this effect on our politics where the parties of the left, which during most of the 20th century had focused on the working class, most of which was uh, white uh, in Europe and the United States, increasingly began to understand marginalization, not as this broad working class, but the specific groups, uh, identity groups that had been victimized in, you know, in particular ways. And one of the things that's gone on 
in virtually every advanced country is that the left has lost ground. And so this gets back to this explanation of why is it after the financial crisis that it was the, the right that, that profited and not the left. And I think part of the reason is that the left increasingly lost touch with these mainstream white voters that had been the basis of their, uh, their core support during much of the 20th century because of this shift in the left's understanding of identity. Now, the current moment is, I think, particularly fraught uh, because we have now seen the adoption of this identity framing uh, by people on the right. Now, of course, there's always been racism and xenophobia uh, in, uh, in societies. Uh, this is not something new, but the way that a lot of right-wing identity groups frame their, uh, their problem is borrowed from the left. So now you get like white nationalists that say, we as white people are an oppressed minority. We are the ones that are being victimized. We're being victimized by the preferential treatment given to you know, minorities, to women, uh, to uh, refugees, uh, to immigrants, uh, and we simply need to reclaim uh, our equal rights. This has, of course, been abetted by politicians that see that you know, this, uh, stoking this kind of anger is uh, their route to power. But I think uh, it's very important to note that there is a core of truth in that assertion. Uh, if you think about the situation of a lot of white working class people over the last generation, it has not been good. Uh, they've lost jobs, they've lost income. Uh, for roughly half of Americans, they are either uh, making no more money in real terms or are actually poorer than they were in the year 2000. So 18 years have passed with no uh, gains to income. Uh, a lot of the communities are falling apart, single parent families, high crime rates, drug use. In the United States, we have a very large uh, opioid crisis. And I think a lot of the people in that group feel that the elites, meaning the two uh, political parties in the United States, but here it could be the, you know, the two dominant parties in Britain, simply were not paying any attention to them, did not have an agenda that would address their specific uh, questions, uh, uh, their, their specific uh, concerns, and in general, you know, looked down upon them uh, with something like contempt. Certainly the cultural elites, I think, were uh, quite guilty of that. And so this is what's led to the current situation where instead of a politics that has been divided between a left and right, defined by their attitudes towards the free market or towards redistribution, to social protections, to um, economic regulation, we now have a politics that is increasingly based on fixed identities. And I think this is not good for uh, democracy. In the United States, we are rapidly moving to a point where the Republican Party is basically the party of white people. Uh, and where the Democratic Party is the party of uh, minorities and women. And the problem with that in a democracy, other than that it creates this incredible polarization uh, on the two sides of, of this divide, is that you know, the, 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 these are fixed identities that you are born with, and it makes rigid your attitude towards politics, towards culture. And in the United States, unfortunately, it's seeping down into you know, the very personal relationships between people that had been friends or, you know, at least could agree to disagree on political matters. Uh, and it's led to an extremely dysfunctional politics. I think something similar has taken place as a result of the Brexit vote that has created this completely new division in British politics that had not uh, existed before, and it's led to an emotional investment in demonizing you know, the other side that uh, is also not uh, healthy for politics. Now, uh, when Matthew comes back on, I think we'll have plenty of time to discuss you know, potential solutions to this. I would, I guess, like to leave you with a little bit of a hopeful uh, observation, which is that identity can correspond to culture, but it's not the same thing as a longstanding you know, culture where people have believed the same thing for, you know, hundreds of uh, years. Identity is inherently uh, plastic. It, it, it can be shaped by human actors. Uh, it has been deliberately 
sliced and diced into narrow identities uh, over the past uh, generation. There's a certain dynamic and a, and a logic to that. But it can also be made bigger. And I think that, in a sense, if you're going to have a successful democracy, you have to worry about something like national identity. Uh, I think, for better or worse, it's the nation state that is the locus of uh, our politics because that's the unit that deploys power. You cannot have legitimate power without a nation state, and therefore our politics has to revolve around democratic processes to legitimate and use and control uh, that power. And you cannot have a democracy, you cannot have a democracy if you do not have a common national identity, meaning an identity uh, where you agree on basic principles of the legitimacy of institutions that allow you to deliberate and to come to uh, collective decisions. I think that nationalism has gotten, has given national identity a bad name because it does oftentimes tend to become uh, aggressive, but it need not. It can be a creedal identity or uh, a civic identity in which your identity is not based on your race or your ethnicity. It's really based on a commonly shared set of ideas. In the United States, I thought we had gotten to that point uh, by the end of the civil rights era where being an American meant belief in the Constitution and the rule of law, principle of uh, human equality. Uh, and that's really now what's under threat. I think it's under threat primarily at the moment from the right by people that would like to drag us back into an ethnic uh, understanding of what uh, identity is. Now, there's other things in terms of public policy that I think we can do, uh, uh, but maybe uh, at this point I'll leave it at that and uh, I'll look forward to the, uh, uh, to the discussion and then to your questions. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Francis, and uh, so much to chew on there. Um, I, just to return briefly to, as it were, the, the, the whole question of how we got to where we are. Um, liberal individualism um, and the kind of tension between citizenship and consumerism seems to me, at least in part, to have given way to a kind of group mentality. Um, why is that? Why is that so? So, um, I think that this is one of the big problems in a liberal democracy. Liberal democracies, uh, by definition, do not tell you how to live. You know, that's really, the, the good life is something that's left up to private choice and to private individuals. Uh, it gives us a great deal of freedom, but a lot of times we actually don't want that freedom because we want shared values, we want community, we want, you know, connection to other people. Other cultures have much more tightly bound you know, communities. Uh, in a liberal society, we don't have that. What we have is a lot of peace and prosperity, which is great if you don't have peace and prosperity, but if you start taking it for granted, you begin to want other things. You know? And particularly, and, and, and I guess the other thing to say is that there's no liberal society in existence that has actually lived up to its own ideals in terms of treating uh, uh, its own citizens or citizens treating each other with the kind of equal respect that you know, they are theoretically due. And so I think that creates the grounds for people saying, actually, I don't want to just have complete freedom of choice and you know, lots of stuff that I can buy in the Walmart or the Ikea. I, I actually want you know, human connections with other people, and I want uh, you know, my connection uh, with them to be recognized by, you know, by others. Uh, and so that leads, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's this thumos that I was talking about that leads people back into politics to want something. One thing that's, I think, really quite interesting is in Eastern Europe, so Poland, if you look at Poland, Poland now uh, has one of these populist uh, uh, anti-immigrant parties, the Law and Justice Party, uh, and it was the most successful uh, country in the European Union for the 10 years prior to the rise of this party. So you say, well, what, you know, what could possibly make them this angry? And I think part of it is just the fact that the majority of Polish voters these days actually were born after the fall of communism. They don't uh, have a memory of what a real dictatorship was like, unlike their parents' generation. 
they could take peace and prosperity for granted and then they could focus on other issues like, you know, the tyranny of Brussels over, you know, and I mean, because they, in a sense they haven't experienced real tyranny uh, in their own country. So I think, you know, all of these are contributing factors that lead people to want forms of recognition other than the universal recognition that a liberal democracy owes all of its citizens. Because the liberal mindset is not only happy with, but invites complexity of identity, the multi-layered identity. And is there a sense in which that extremely complex disaggregation that modernity has brought about has encouraged people to kind of recoil a little and to seek tribes and groups uh, uh, using often digital technology where perhaps they might not have done so much in the past? No, I think absolutely. I mean, I think actually the technology has abetted uh, this um, search for identity because it actually makes the process a lot easier, right? So if you were living, you know, in the 1950s and sitting around, a, you know, a, a pub or a coffee shop uh, and you had some crackpot theory about, you know, what the government was doing, um, you probably couldn't find more than one or two other people that you could talk to. Uh, Whereas today on the internet, you know, you can find 10,000 other crackpots that believe exactly, you know, your particular conspiracy theory, and that reinforces your view that actually there is a conspiracy because, you know, all around me, nobody wants to admit this, but in fact, you know, here on the internet, I see that, you know, there's a lot of people who are uh, like-minded. And so it, you know, it allows you to specialize and compartmentalize and wall yourself off from other kinds of information that, that you don't want. I think, you know, um, we were discussing a little bit earlier, it, ha it has a lot of other impacts, you know, as well in terms of people's trust in basic information and, and uh, uh, things of that sort that I think have also contributed to this problem. Because um, one of the things that seems to me to have run through your work, um, going back to the end of history, in fact, is, is an interest in dignity. Mm -hmm. and. Um, one of the common factors in politics in the last 40 years has been a tremendous emphasis upon socioeconomic status and economic prosperity and so on. And almost a sense that uh, economic prosperity and liberalism were inevitable uh, handmade. They, they work together. Um, have we really lost... I mean, what is one of the problems here that we lost sight uh, in our politics of the need for dignity, that we, we always assume, we, in a way, adopted a kind of materialist approach to history and, and didn't think hard enough about the importance of dignity alongside that. Uh, I think those two are actually related in a lot of ways because uh, what a job or what wealth convey to people uh, past a certain subsistence level of existence is actually dignity. Right, that I have a job which means that society values me enough to pay me a wage in return for what, uh, for what I do. Uh, the other aspect of dignity that, that um, uh, comes into play is that status is oftentimes a relative thing, so that no matter what your absolute level of wealth or income or you know, how many cars you have, uh, if there's people that you see around you that have you know, clearly more, then you feel bad. Uh, and I think that's what propels, you know, a quest for status. And in a certain sense, in a capitalist society, you're never satisfied with, with what you have, uh, even though you're living at a material level of wealth that for, you know, impoverished people in the developing world would be, you know, a miracle if they could, you know, uh, if they could get there. And I think that that's, you know, also what's driving a lot of the unhappiness is this perceived well, it's not just perceived. I mean, there, there's a reality. Every country uh, around the world has developed a class of oligarchs. You know, uh, the economic growth, and there's been a huge amount of economic growth over the past uh, 30, 40 years, uh, really has gone to a pretty narrow slice of, you know, the population. Uh, and they live in a way that, you know, is scarcely comprehensible to, you know, to people that haven't benefited in that sense. And I think that also has contributed to the sense of resentment and anger. I mean, is, is that which raises an interesting question, which is, does liberalism have uh, kind of conditions attached to it in the sense that if that income, if that gap in, in the distribution of wealth becomes so great, mm -hmm. does liberalism start to bend and fray? Uh, 
Well, of course. I mean, I, I think that's why we want liberal democracy. Yeah. You know, I mean, pure liberalism of the sort that Britain, you know, uh, 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 practiced in the uh, first part of the 19th century produces gigantic inequalities. If you simply have a market economy with no state sitting over it to equalize outcomes to some extent, uh, you're going to end up with these inequalities and you're going to end up with social uh, discord because people really don't uh, like that. And so I think the modern solution has always been uh, a market economy attached to a fundamentally democratic uh, political order in which ordinary people were not given necessarily an equal share of income or wealth, but they were given an equal political voice that then would allow them to, you know, elect the Labour Party after World War II that, you know, then put into place, uh, you know, the modern welfare state and so forth. The problem, I think, now is that you have political decay, meaning that a lot of the elites have gamed the system to the point where it's no longer a, uh, a level playing field. Uh, and they can capture parts of the state and make it work for them. They can exempt themselves from taxation. Uh, they can get away with not providing basic social services as long as they're taken care of, uh, this sort of thing. And I think that, is, that perception uh, has you know, a lot of reality to it. And that, again, contributes to the sense of unfairness uh, in the way that the system has. So in other words, you need liberal democracy, but the democracy part I don't think has been actually working all that well. Because if you were to look ahead at the sort of available mechanisms to right that perceived wrong, the problem of inequality, those mechanisms are not conspicuously present, are they? I mean, we've got the juggernaut of automation coming towards us, um, big tech corporations that have as much, if not more, power as many nation states. Mm -hmm. how, do, how does one go about uh, restoring, a, uh, restoring the grip of democracy upon mm -hmm. the economy? Well, the, the automation problem, I really don't know what the answer is. I mean... It's another book. Uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that's a situation where I actually, you know, if you look at the current debate over that, although there's some empirical disagreement about how big a problem it's, it is, you know, I think everybody recognizes that that's really one of the chief threats in the future. And I think a lot of the answers that are being put forward, like universal basic yeah. income or just more education have got a lot of problems with them. And so I, I, I'm going to duck, you know, sure. uh, uh, answering that. Uh, the, it's honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other part of it is just a, is a, is a political issue, you know. Um, how do you get Facebook and Google and Microsoft and these gigantic tech companies, for example, to uh, behave in a pro-social way rather than in a destructive way, well, that's a matter of political power. Uh, actually, as an American, I'm actually glad that you've got the European Union that's coming down on them like a ton of bricks because in our political system, we're not willing to, you know, we're not willing to do that because we distrust government and, uh, and so forth. But I think it's just like any other political mobilization. You've got to get, first of all, you've got to convince the troops that this is something necessary. You have to have grassroots mobilization. You have to have a workable game plan, and you have to have a certain amount of leadership. But in the end, you know, uh, uh, if you have determined political majorities in your political sphere, you know, even these big economic powers are going to have to, you know, give in to the power of a of a state that's got consensus. Uh, the problem, you know, is that we don't have the consensus right now, uh, and so the the question for political leadership is how do you get it and how do you mobilize people? So let's talk a little bit about some of the potential solutions. Um, you talked, in your, you mentioned in your talk, and, and you talk great, right at great length and fascinatingly about what you call creedal national identities. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that very interesting idea? Yeah. Well, you know, I can explain it uh, best by just a little history lesson. So. In the United States, uh, after the uh, signing of the Constitution, up until the Civil War, you did not have a creedal national identity. Uh, you had an identity that was basically based on race uh, and also gender, uh, so that only white men, uh, initially only white men with property were allowed to be citizens, were regarded as full human beings. And in some, I think, deep sense, the Civil War in the 1860s was fought over the question of, of American national identity. 
were black people actually part of this political community? Were they considered uh, human beings? Uh, the North won the war uh, at the cost of 600,000 lives, a very bloody uh, conflict, and in the wake of it, you passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment uh, extended due process to all Americans, and the 15th Amendment guaranteed voting rights. It takes another 100 years until the civil rights movement in the 1960s, until the promise of what Abraham Lincoln had called a new birth of freedom is actually realized for, uh, for black people in the United States. It takes until you know, the second decade of the 20th century for women to be included in that, uh, you know, in that circle. But I think that by the time you get to the 1960s, it does become possible to say that you know, an American is somebody who believes in a certain set of basic you know, democratic values. That's the, the qualification for joining that community and it's no longer based on these characteristics like your, your, your race or ethnicity. So that's what it is meant by a creedal identity and I think that's what's really at, at threat right now. And in the States, as you imply, there's the Constitution um, there's the Pledge of Allegiance. There are a whole manner of uh, structural uh, institutions and, and, and practices, that conventions, that in, or enforce that mm -hmm. creedal national identity. In this country, which you know, you're, you, you've been a frequent visitor to, to and know well and have many friends here, it's less obvious. I mean, mm -hmm. traditionally, people spoke of institutions. Then they start like the monarchy, um, parliament, laterally the BBC, the NHS. There's been a great uh, crash of trust in many of those institutions. Um, and it, we're now going through um, what might politely be called a bit of a sticky patch with Brexit. <laughs> uh, very politely. Um, so give us some hope. What, what, what would be the Fukuyama creedal national identity for Britain for 2019 onwards? Well, I think that for any developed uh, democracy, it's got to revolve around basically these I enlightenment ideas about, uh, you know, constitutional democracy. Just because you don't have a written constitution doesn't mean you don't have a constitution. Uh, you have certain historical traditions of, uh, you know, British liberty that I think are at the basis of what, you know, makes uh, this country what it is and distinguishes it from countries that don't enjoy that kind of liberty. Uh, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, all of these I think are constitutive of the way that this political community has uh, understood itself. And so I think those would be components of citizenship. I think that this country has a much, in a way, a much easier problem uh, in defining that kind of a democratic identity than a, a lot of countries on the continent. Because in many, um, member states of the EU, citizenship, for example, is still restricted by ethnicity. Uh, you can't actually, and, and it's, it's also a cultural thing. So, um, you know, if you're a, 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 a second, third generation children of Pakistani immigrants, you can still say, I'm British. And in a way, you know, the very term British was meant to overcome the interior, you know, the, the existing divisions between Scotch, Irish, you know, English, and so forth. So it's a, it's a broad, inclusive uh, concept of citizenship. And so if you're Pakistani uh, of origin, you can still say, I'm a British citizen, and I you know, participate in those British um, uh, traditions. Uh, it's not that easy to do that in, in you know, Denmark or in Germany, where citizenship is really linked to ethnicity. And so if you're a, you know, a, a Turk that doesn't speak any Turkish because you were born and raised in Germany, it's still difficult for you to say, I'm a, I'm a German, because you know, people will look at you a little bit funny and say, well, you're actually not a German. You know? uh, so I think that that's kind of the task that is in front of a lot of countries in Europe, is first of all to try to establish some common ground for citizenship and for inclusion in the national community uh, that is meaningful, is democratic, is based on these enlightenment values, and then to regard the job of dealing with immigrants not as keeping them out, but actually of uh, assimilating or integrating them to that, uh, to that set of values. Well, assimilation and integration aren't the same, are they? Um, let's talk about that a bit. I mean, what, how far 
uh, does integration have to go? Because obviously there's a huge debate, mm -hmm. not confined to this country, about, as it were, what, how big that, what Habermas would call the public sphere has to be. Mm -hmm. um, is it just payment of taxes, obedience to the law, or is it uh, more than that? Is it uh, obedience to a series or, or in, in involvement in a series of pra conventional practices? Mm -hmm. So religious freedom has mm -hmm. become a massive issue in this country, yes. which is how are there areas where religious freedom uh, crosses swords with uh, the, the rights of women and so on? Yeah. And you have a, an endless stream of incommensurable values here. How do you resolve those kind of conflicts? Well, on the uh, incommensurable values, I think that one of the things you actually have to focus on is that there are certain core values in a liberal democracy that you really should not abridge in the name of cultural tolerance, right? So again, I mean, this is a you know, sort of classic case where you have a family that wants to send their daughter you know, back to the country of origin uh, for an arranged marriage because that's the cultural tradition in that, um, in that uh, society. I think that that is is incompatible with basic uh, liberal values having uh, to do with individual equality and individual agency. You know, in a liberal society, we believe that women should have control uh, over these big choices in life about who they marry and so forth. And so I think that one of the mistakes that's been made by this wrong interpretation of multiculturalism is to not understand that there is actually a set of necessary values that underlie a modern liberal democracy and that in that respect, not all cultures are actually uh, equal uh, and that you do have to make some, uh, some choices in favor of the ones that really you know, are organic to your, uh, to your political order. Now, it's, it's a complicated issue about how much, uh, how much glue there is in a society. So in the United States, we've got this big problem that we have a very thin culture. Like, you know, you take a gay waiter in San Francisco with all the earrings and tattoos and you compare that person to a, you know, to an oil rig worker in, in Louisiana, you know, they don't eat the same food, they don't uh, have the same religion, they don't, uh, uh, you know, like the same sports, you know, there's very little uh, that ties them together uh, because the country is so diverse. And so our problem is, I think, actually creating a somewhat thicker culture that would bind us together. So this is why I actually like the idea of national service, uh, because if you give people common uh, experiences, it may you know, thicken uh, the ties that they have uh, with one another. In a lot of Europe, the problem is just the opposite, that they've got thick cultures already that's based on religion, on ethnicity, on food, on a lot of traditions that are very, very deeply embedded. Uh, that a lot of newcomers aren't going to share. And so they do have to peel away, you know, the ones that are real obstacles to accepting um, uh, outsiders, uh, but keep ones that are, you know, actually transmissible and open to, uh, you know, to people that come from different places. Has the left of center become too preoccupied by the problem of offense? and yeah. not open enough to the contest of ideas? Well, I would say uh, they have indulged in a certain kind of dignity politics where uh, you know, they worry tremendously about the dignity of you know, particular groups, and that ground is shifting constantly. And you, you can kind of see this in the evolution of things like gender pronouns. So it used to be that people thought they were just men and women, but then there are trans people, and then there's, you know, um, uh, people of, you know, uh, kind of intermediate genders uh, that uh, are neither, you know, the first three, uh, and you get this constant proliferation, but then a lot of indignation when you do not recognize the dignity of these groups that, you know, nobody had actually even seen as, as distinct, you know, objects of discrimination uh, and so forth. And so, I think that that has, you know, shifted the focus and, and it's actually had this effect of alienating, I think, a lot of the mainstream people that say, okay, you know, fine, I, I want to be tolerant and so forth, but I don't really understand this new world where we have to be super sensitive. And so this, again, has played directly into politics. So why did a lot of people vote for Donald Trump? 
he insults Mexicans, he insults women, or he assaults women, he uh, mocks a disabled uh, reporter, they actually voted for him because he did those things, you know, because he wasn't subject to this kind of pervasive um, political correctness. And I think, you know, he was practicing a kind of politics of authenticity uh, because, you know, in his tweeting, everybody thinks, I mean, nobody could have made up that tweet that he just, you know, sent off this morning. It has to be the real Donald. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, so, He's his own parody account, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he that's really right. Is. But that in itself uh, is, is alarming, isn't it? Because it suggests that, the, the, that public discourse has reached a point where you have, on the one hand, uh, a kind of nativist, misogynistic yes. uh, discourse, and on the other, uh, a discourse that's, that's trying to, that is so timid mm -hmm. and so nervous of causing offense that it's saying practically nothing. Mm -hmm. So how do you, again, ha the question comes back to how do you usher people back into the public sphere to, to talk to each other in civil, civil ways? Uh, I think you need to draw different kinds of boundaries over, around acceptable discourse. Uh, so I think, you know, some of the rules of political correctness really do need to be relaxed a little bit. And where that relaxation occurs is, you know, is, is complex. I mean, so you see this very much in the use of the term racism. Uh, I think that that term is overused by many people on the left to denounce behaviors that oftentimes are actually not, you know, I mean, there, there are different forms that racism can take, and it's one that's used a little bit too expansively. Uh, so uh, everybody that points out a cultural difference between different ethnic groups is not thereby a racist, you know, simply to acknowledge the fact that, you know, certain groups have certain, you know, characteristics, do better in school, you know, this sort of thing. So I think we need to, you know, in a way, kind of relax a little bit about that, that rhetoric. But then we have to recognize that there are these people that really are racist, you know, and are introducing a much, much uglier kind of discourse uh, into, you know, what is acceptable speech. So this is, you know, I, mean, I, I know this is a kind of mushy answer, uh, but, but I do think that, you know, on both sides, we need to readjust the boundaries. How much of this do liberals have to own? I mean, to a certain extent, you know, the liberal moment has, if not passed, certainly come to a, you know, a very, a very big climacteric. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of liberals feel that, that, uh, that there's, no, there's no way back and that they have to, they're in a kind of cringe position. Yeah. So what bits of liberalism can be protected, defended, and how does it have to adapt to this new situation? Well, uh, I think you actually need to think about this politically because you need to, in a democracy, you're not going to ever get your full agenda. You know, that's not what happens in a democracy. You're, you're going to have to make compromises. So you have to decide on what elements of your agenda you're, you know, you're willing to, to make a, um, a deal on. Let me just give you an example with, with regard to immigration. And, and it gets back to this point about racism. So, not everybody that is worried about the current immigration regime, either in Europe or in the United States, is a racist. It's, it's simply not true. There are other, I think, legitimate reasons for worrying about the current regime. So one of them is the fact that a lot of immigration is illegal, right? People think there's a rule of law, we have rules, and we ought to enforce those rules. And that, I think, is a reasonable worry. Another worry is, will an immigrant actually um, uh, assimilate or integrate into our, you know, uh, our culture and accept the values that, you know, underlie citizenship. And that's a legitimate worry as well. So people that, you know, object on those grounds, I think, are not necessarily racist, but they're, you know, they're raising real uh, uh, concerns. And as a political strategy, uh, I think when you deal with immigration, you've got to disaggregate uh, and, and separate the, the real racists and xenophobes from people that worry about these other categories of issues where you can actually adjust policy to meet them halfway, right? So actually, so this is this, this problem I have. I mean, I think that every day Donald Trump says like a hundred really offensive and obnoxious things, but every hundredth thing that comes out of his mouth is actually correct. Uh, and 
One of them, for example, is, is that, that countries ought to be able to control their borders. You know, I don't think you can have a democracy uh, if you can't actually determine who the demos is, who the people are. Uh, and that means, you know, it, it, you need to exert some kind of sovereign control over who comes into the country, who's a citizen, uh, and that sort of thing. I don't think, you know, making that assertion makes you uh, a racist. And I think that, you know, kind of understanding that you can actually peel away a certain amount of this populist anger if you, you know, if you try to disaggregate and, and then see what concerns are more legitimate than others, I think that would go some way to, um, you know, actually governing in over this space where things are, you know, currently as polarized as they but are. But I guess that gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? Because the question is how many of those grievances are legitimate? Mm -hmm. If you take what happened with the Brexit referendum, the Leave campaign campaigned incredibly hard on immigration, and the Remain campaign didn't campaign on immigration at all. So yeah. the immigration argument went by default to Leave, which was essentially immigration is a bad thing, it's out mm -hmm. of control, uh, it was presented as a sort of free-for-all, there's no such thing. Um, no one was making the argument for the uh, necessities of immigration. For example, the National Health Service depends hugely on immigration in this country. So the question that this begs is how much do liberals have to, as it were, appease that feeling and how much do mm -hmm. they have to fight back against it? So actually, immigration is really important. Mm -hmm. you know, imagine your, the society that you live in and, and all the benefits it has without immigration. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, you have to engage in that debate and, and you know, actually make moral arguments about what sorts of policies are illegitimate and which ones are actually reasonable. So there's an economic argument in favor of the NHS, you know, and the need for immigrants. There's also an argument about, you know, the rate of cultural change and what, you know, is an acceptable rate. I think that's something you can have a, you know, a, 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 a rational uh, deliberation over. Uh, so, I mean, I guess this is my feeling that it was a big mistake for the Remainers to think about this just in economic terms. They, they simply were not perceiving what was bothering people on the other side because they were cosmopolitan and educated and benefited from all of this movement of people. Uh, and I do think that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm fundamentally on that side. I would have voted to remain if I had been a British citizen. But I do think that you need to uh, a little bit sympathetically understand what's motivating people on the other side if you are going to, you know, actually try to diffuse some of, uh, you know, some of that anger. Reverting to, to the whole question of measures um, and, and how to uh, germinate and nurture this sense of national identity, you mentioned national service. Um, presumably education plays a big part in it. Yes. Would you, uh, I mean, how, how would you um, bake this, these ideas into a curriculum? How, how would that be done? Yeah, so um, the degree of ignorance of, uh, I, I don't know what the situation is here, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's different, but in the United States, they do surveys of uh, high school uh, graduates, and the uh, uh, amount that they don't know about their own political system is really shocking, you know, that only like 30% of them can name one right in the Bill of Rights, you know, a uh, very small minority of them can name what the three branches of government are, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, and so I think that, you know, teaching people about their own democratic institutions is, you know, something that needs to be re-injected into the curriculum. And this is actually where multiculturalism has played, I think, a negative role because you can't really understand the origins of these democratic institutions unless you know a little bit about the history of your country and then the other kinds of traditions that you know, stand behind them, and they're all Western traditions. I mean, that's the way we evolved to the point uh, we are now, but teaching that, you know, that particular set of historical facts, you know, has in a, in a sense been, you know, delegitimated. Uh, and so it is, you know, uh, it is a little bit of an uphill slog to try to re-inject uh, a sense of, you know, how we got to the place we are back into a, a school curriculum maybe uh, people will be persuaded of the necessity when they see that the threat is not coming from, you know, the identitarians of the left that say that history is just a history of racism, patriarchy, but by identitarians of the right that want to, you know, in a sense, uh, 
capture that history and, you know, and use it to drag uh, the country back into a more you know, ethnic understanding of, of identity. Because one thing identity groups are fantastically good at is providing people with stories and narratives that explain who they are, where they've come from, and where they're going. And what's interesting, uh, and I think implicit in, in what you're saying, is that the, na the national community has got very bad at that. Yes. Um, the, 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 the story of nationhood has mm -hmm. been or more or less lost. Mm -hmm. it, so, uh, this is delicate terrain for a it's lot of people. It's very delicate terrain, Because, yeah. because it, it, the, 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 the gap between patriotism and nationalism is always, you know, hotly contested. But is it, I mean, starting where we're starting rather than where we'd like to start, because I think liberals often start where they'd like to start rather than where they are, what, what would be the steps that you could take to to, to reassert that without sounding fantastically old-fashioned? <laughs> um, well, you know, like I said, given that we're kind of in a defensive crouch right mm -hmm. now, maybe just being a little bit old-fashioned wouldn't, be so, yeah. wouldn't be so bad, you know, uh, saying that actually we do have this civic understanding of, you know, of our identity. Uh, I do think that you have to honestly craft these stories. So, Again, another little anecdote. When, um, so Thanksgiving is a big American holiday. It's actually my favorite holiday because it's, you know, it's, it's something celebrated really by all Americans uh, as a celebration of their freedom in a certain sense. So I remember when my daughter was in grade school, uh, they you know, had a Thanksgiving pageant and so forth. I asked her, well, what did you learn about um, uh, Thanksgiving? And she said, well, I learned that um, uh, all the Indians were killed. And uh, I said, oh, you know, well, that's an interesting, you know, conclusion. And so that's not, quite the, that's not quite the right narrative, you know, that I would construct. So it does seem to me that it's completely possible to tell, tell the story of the evolution of any of our modern democracies without whitewashing any of the crimes and the racism and the patriarchy and all of those things that did, you know, in fact... And, and that's what I've tried to do in my own writing. So, you know, if you look at my last couple of books about the evolution of institutions, I talk about colonialism and I, you know, talk about these highly unjust, you know, hierarchical systems. But it does seem to me you can also tell a progressive story about how as a result of, you know, political struggle stretching over generations, you know, you are, you, are, you know, eventually able to overcome uh, a lot of those uh, prejudices and, you know, injustices. You're never going to get there to a perfectly just society, but, you know, it is possible to tell a positive story that, you know, should resonate with people. And, in fact, I think the people that it resonates the most with are actually recent immigrants, that, you know, they come from societies that they know are really, really defective, and they don't want to move to, you know, Britain or the United States because it's the home of racism and patriarchy. They, you know, they actually think that there's something uh, valuable in the kinds of freedoms that have evolved in these sorts of societies. Because an interesting minor parable of this recently was, um, as I'm sure you know, astronaut Scott Kelly uh, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings uh, made the uh, uh, great error of quoting Churchill um, on Twitter, which uh, doing anything on Twitter can be an error. Um, and was subject to a kind of massive online attack and um, came out and said he was terribly sorry to have uh, upset everyone and he would go away and re-educate himself on Churchill. And this, <laughs> this then ran, which was odd because he's a man who did four space missions and serviced the Hubble telescope, which you'd think he would be able to stand up to a Twitter mob, but apparently not. Um, it's actually a measure of how alarming being subject to a Twitter attack can be. Um, there, there is a problem, isn't there, to, to, to stick with the historical question, when it is no longer possible to quote Churchill without becoming the subject of a kind of uh, digital frenzy. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's something we just have to, um, you know, learn about and not get intimidated by. Uh, and I think that's the role of political leadership, is to actually not be intimidated by Twitter mobs, you know. Uh, uh, maybe that's, you know, the kind of leadership that is necessary but really hasn't been forthcoming from a, a lot of people. Um, so we'll have to see. I mean, like in the United States, uh, 
you have um, you know, the president of one university that's actually stood up for real uh, academic freedom you know, at the University of Chicago, and the Twitter mobs didn't get him. You know? So I think you know, it's possible. Is there, in, in, you mentioned not being intimidated. It's very interesting because you're, throughout your, your career, you've always stood up for Enlightenment values. And I think sometimes there's a presumption that Enlightenment values are always, in some sense, permissive. You know, they're about the, the, the liberty to do stuff. Yeah. But actually, I think if I'm reading your work correctly, you, you also play a high, place high value on duties. Yes. And upon the duty to be a citizen. In other words, to go back to Franklin's famous remark about you know, what manner of government have you bequeathed us, Dr. Franklin, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Yes. That you are very much of the view that democracy is not a free ride. Yes. I am not a libertarian. You no. know, I don't think the end of government is just to let people do whatever the hell they want. I think that, you know, in a sense, uh, I mean, it's a more classical Republican uh, understanding of, of political community where you actually want to cultivate public-spirited people. You want to cultivate citizens that are informed, knowledgeable, able to deliberate, able to, you know, come to common decisions because that's what it means to have self-government. You know, that's, that's what self-government is. And so I don't think that the, you know, the state can be neutral between people that, you know, don't care about uh, politics uh, um, and don't pay attention uh, and, and simply delegate that to others and, and those that are much more actively involved. So that's why I like national service. I was interviewed by, you know, uh, Reason magazine, which is a libertarian magazine. They didn't like my book. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I really think that especially, you know, when you have this kind of diversity, if you don't do a certain amount of social engineering, uh, you're not actually going to solve some of those problems of creating community because it does have to be engineered to some extent. Do you, do you think political, you mentioned political leadership, do you think political leaders have become too frightened of making demands of citizens? Because if yes. you look at the, the great political oratory of the past, whether it's Lincoln or Mandela or Churchill or Harvey Milk or Martin Luther King, all these people made demands of the people they addressed. They didn't simply make them retail offers. That's right. I mean, it's easier to do when you're under, you know, external threat. Uh, it's easier to do when you fear, you know, the collapse of your society from financial crisis or, you know, some other uh, event. And it could be that you're not going to get that kind of leadership until this kind of external shock suddenly appears. Uh, but that is one of the functions of leadership, to take advantage of situations that open up political space that you didn't think existed uh, previously. Last question I want to ask Francis is, um, do, do you, what do you think the, the next 10 years hold for this particular field of identity politics? I mean, is it, is, is it going to get worse before it gets better or what? No, I'm hoping everybody will read and buy my book and then they'll be convinced that we need national identity the and they'll... Is such a good salesman. <laughs> Brilliant. No, well, but, but, no, but seriously, you know, I think that um, in the... Uh, the same uh, New York Times book review where my book was uh, reviewed, there are actually four books on identity, uh, all of which uh, were critical of the way that identity politics had evolved in the United States. And I thought it was actually a sign of the times that the New York Times, which has been a tribune in a certain sense of a certain kind of identity politics, was, you know, was willing to do this. And so that's why I think that's what happens in a democracy. You know, you, have to try to persuade people, and part of that work, you know, has to be done by, uh, you know, by people that make arguments and put them out in front of people because, uh, you know, over time, that's the way, I mean, that's how the conservative revolution happened, you know, you had a lot of theorists like Milton Friedman uh, and so forth that stood behind people like Reagan and Thatcher that gave, you know, uh, more intellectual weight, and so I think we need, a, you know, a little bit more of that kind of discussion when it comes to these sorts of issues. Excellent. Now, I'd like to um, take some questions from the floor. Um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is take groups of three. If we could maybe raise the lights up a little so I can see people or... Um, not possible. Okay. Um, I shall do my best. If you want to stick your hands up very... There's a question just here. So we'll take three at a time. 
In my lifetime, I've seen we've moved from a class system to a meritocracy. That meritocracy favors professional and academic success. And it's easy, and, and people have risen to succeeded very well in global globalization. They've benefited from that enormously. Do you think that uh, has led to fostering identity politics because it's easier to break people up by allowing them to indulge in identity politics? And in a way, the clever people can push the stupid people around because they're busy fighting with each other. <laughs> and then the clever people can tell them what to do. And they wield a kind of global uh, overlay. Well, that's Thank you. Very... Well, let's let's yeah, take okay, some yeah, time. Okay. There's a question over there. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris, from uh, the Urban Land Institute. Uh, we spoke about uh, the nation state as being the unit that deploys power. And uh, it's really difficult to get identities to work through uh, body politics that aren't the nation state. Are there alter territorial alternatives to that? For example, urban regions versus the nation. Okay, and one more there. Me, thanks. Um, so I had a question going back to the 2016 election, the Brexit and Trump. Might there be a silver lining in both, in the sense of A, the debate we're having, B, in Brexit, the um, opportunity to redefine our national sense of national glue or those positive mm -hmm. um, sides of nationalism that you alluded to? And certainly Trump, if he's nothing else, he's a politician who can stand up to a Twitter storm. <laughs> so uh, a question on the, uh, the implications of the, the, the movement from class system to meritocracy, the, uh, the, the, the merits of looking at, uh, through the prism of urban regions, and then the silver lining of uh, 2016. Yeah. So I've never actually heard the suggestion before that meritocracy actually promotes identity politics, I would have thought that the two of them are actually a little bit at odds because the biggest pushback in many cases against identity politics is that you're trying to promote somebody just because they're black or just because they're female, you know, they're members of these big groups, but individually they actually may not, you know, be the best person for the job. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conflicts, uh, you know, like Harvard University right now is being sued because uh, the argument is they're discriminating against Asians where on a pure meritocracy basis, you know, there'd be a lot of them. Uh, so I'll have to think about, <laughs> I'll have to think about your uh, suggestion because I think that right now I see more of a conflict between the principle of meritocracy and the principle of identity. By the way, I'm not simply on, on the side of meritocracy. I mean, I do think that actually people have advantages and can see, succeed in a meritocratic competition, you know, because they are members of groups. They're born into the right family, they're born into the right social class or the right neighborhood. So it's not unreasonable that, you know, there should be compensation that's also based on those categories, but it really does um, bump up against a, a principle that as individuals, you know, we should be judged. Um, in terms of regions, yeah, of course, so, um, one of the big problems, I think, in these very large units that we call nations is that they actually have a tremendous amount of, you know, regional variation. They're really not uniform, and I think that one of the moves towards decentralization, federalism, uh, um, autonomy for regions has been to recognize that uh, you're not simply going to homogenize people over you know, a very large area. The United States would be completely ungovernable if it were a unitary centralized um, uh, state. And so I do think that there's an opportunity to work at smaller uh, scales uh, by, um, uh, by doing that. Um, the third one was on... Uh, the, the silver lining of 2016. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I think that 2016 did uh, several things that were good. So first of all, it's not as if uh, these populists are just ignorant, you know, fools that don't understand how good things have been. Uh, the elites in America and Europe have really screwed up in big ways. You know? In America, you had the Iraq War and then the financial crisis. In Europe, you had the Euro crisis and the, uh, uh, the migrant crisis. All of these are elite-generated uh, screw-ups in, in, in policy. They're the results of elite 
policies, so it's not unreasonable that ordinary people are uh, upset about that. And furthermore, you know, as I was saying in terms of, you know, the, the views of a lot of these downwardly mobile white working class people, that has become all of a sudden a salient issue because of the, you know, of those elections. And it does represent, you know, in, in a way, real democratic participation. The other good effect it's had is on the other side, uh, you know, the populists have been so extreme that they've generated a lot of mobilization on the left. Uh, and so my students, you know, uh, in, a, in the last midterm election at Stanford, only 17% uh, of students actually voted in the election. Uh, I guarantee you this election, the number is going to be a lot higher because I think they've gotten a good civics lesson that if you don't pay attention, you don't vote, <laughs> uh, look at what you end up with. <laughs> There's a lady in the white polo neck. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for an interesting conversation today. Um, you've talked about Georgian politics and there are presidential elections coming up now in Georgia. So I wanted to ask you, how would you compare Georgia's economic, social and political development under the leadership of third president Saakashvili with the current government <laughs> under the leadership of the oligarch who doesn't officially hold a political position in Georgian politics? Thank you. Excellent. And then just here. That's it, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm interested in like the, this narrative of progression that you talk about for the nation state. Um, and you, you, you mentioned the importance of like having a narrative, but in terms of actually putting that into practice, isn't it then necessary for things like political correctness to not be sort of dismissed as sort of unnecessary oversensitivity? Because political correctness began, like you mentioned in the 60s from groups that were once marginalized standing up for sort of their right f for, to be represented and to have social justice. And isn't that what we're seeing today with more groups like, for example, transgender that are now a asking for, for the rights that they deserve in the society? And, th and if we kind of dismiss that, then we fall into continuing for the narrative to be shaped by the sort of old white rich men that have shaped the narrative of democracy and mm -hmm. of liberalism from the beginning. Okay, and then there was a gentleman there, yeah. Hi, I think um, in your earlier book, The End of History, you postulated that the liberal democracy is the ultimate form of government for mankind. And, you know, like after something around 25 years, my question is, or I'm curious to know, given the situation we are in due to the politicians like Putin, Trump, Modi, etc., do you still hold that belief that, you know, like eventually liberal democracy is going to be the ultimate, de you know, like form of government across the world? So, uh, Georgia, yeah. um, PC the case <laughs> for, yeah. and then reflections on the end of history. Yeah, well, uh, this time next week I'm going to be in Tbilisi, so maybe after I get back we can have a discussion of, <laughs> I mean, I do have opinions about, you know, current political situation you, you describe, and maybe we can talk about that offline. I'm not sure that, you know, I mean, that's, a, a, that's a, quite a specific uh, political thing. But yeah, I don't like the current oligarch. I, I think that things could be uh, better in Georgian politics. Now, the question about, um, you know, the progressive history, I do not in any way advocate uh, airbrushing or glossing over actual injustices that exist in current society, nor do I think that it's wrong for, you know, any marginalized group to push against the specific forms of injustice that it suffers. I'm just saying that you need to balance that against, you know, first of all, the need for a more integrative, larger identity that gives people uh, a common sense of belonging within a broader democratic uh, community, and you also have to give them a certain sense of a source of pride, and that's why I was just saying that if your entire historical uh, narrative is about the injustices that the system has produced, they're not going to have that sense that change is possible, that we can make progress over time, and that, you know, as a democratic community, we're going to uh, make things better. Um, so the question on the so <laughs> you have to back up a little bit about what the end of history was really about, right? It, it wasn't, 
necessarily a prediction that everybody was going to turn democratic uh, in the near future. Uh, history, you know, a synonym for the way that I was using the word history could be the word modernization or it could be the word development. I think those are contemporary terms that we would use in their place. And the question that I was posing was, what is the direction in which modernization is pointing? So the Marxists said it was pointing towards communism and I was observing back in 1989 originally that it didn't look like that was going to happen. Uh, and I still think that, you know, of the different forms of human social organization, I don't see one that is likely to be more successful uh, than some form of liberal democracy tied to some form of market uh, economy. Um, if someone can show me an alternative that seems systematically better, you know, maybe it's China. You know, uh, in another 30 years, if China is much richer, more powerful and completely stable uh, compared to Western democracies, then I would concede that maybe there is an alternative. I was just wrong in my assessment of the directionality of history, but at the moment, uh, I, I think it's an open question. I've got time for two more questions. This lady at the back. Uh, my question is very short. What will happen to Iran? It's good one. Iran. And uh, then there was uh, <laughs> this one. Someone's got the microphone now. Yep. Hi. Thank you. Um, so you were very clear that people like Donald Trump and the far right are a threat to liberal democracy, um, and yet you start your analysis based on some of their assumptions, such as the problem started in the 60s and that the nation state is the core sort of actor. Okay. Okay. I, I was wondering how, how can we counter the narrative of the far right if we yield ground on certain of these issues? Okay, so Iran, and are we yielding too much to the far right, and then we'll have to close down. I don't know what's going to happen in Iran. <laughs> you know? I mean, as, as brief an answer as the question. <laughs> and, and then what about the... Um... So you have to understand... You... I mean, he's good. You've got to give it to him. <laughs> you have to understand that um, my book is not about... I didn't start you know, by blaming uh, the left for the current situation. Uh, what I was, you know, the whole thrust of the book is that the biggest threat we have right now is this uh, new right led by people like Donald Trump and Viktor Orban and the like, uh, and I'm just trying to give an account of how we got there, and if you talk about how our modern concept of identity and identity politics evolved, I think it does, just as a matter of empirical historical fact, it does begin there. That does not mean that I am somehow morally holding, you know, uh, the, that kind of left-wing identity politics responsible for the current problem that we're in. I think that it was legitimate. I think that, you know, these were social justice issues that were, you know, absolutely necessary to uh, uh, resolve. And so, I, I, somehow this idea that I'm blaming the left uh, for Donald Trump has gotten out and it's just not, you know, it's not the argument that's in the book. Well, uh, uh, last time I was leaving there, if I may crave 30 more seconds of your time, um, many more riches ahoy with the How To Academy. Uh, Michael Lewis in conversation with Owen Jones, Peter Frankopan in conversation with Arkela. Do come along to either or both of them. And Francis will very kindly be uh, signing copies of his book. I do urge you to buy a copy, it's fantastic. Please join me in thanking the maestro himself. Thank you.